الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما Last week we spoke about the arrival of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to al Madina, and we spoke about the first few days that he stayed in Quba and we spoke about some of the incidents that happened in Medina during those first few days after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam arrived. We spoke about the building of Masjid Quba. We spoke about the arrival of Suhaib al-Rumi from Mecca to Medina. And today, inshallah, we will talk about the story of one of the great companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu. Now personally, if you ask me which story of which companion of the Prophet ﷺ is the most interesting story out of all of the companions, number one on that list will be this man, Salman al-Farisi. His story is so amazing. The story of his childhood, the story of his travels, the story of his finally ending up in Medina and meeting Rasulullah ﷺ, it is one of the most amazing stories that you will ever come across the story of Salman al-Farisi and Salman al-Farisi he met Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam just when he arrived in al Madinah during those first few days when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in Quba Salman al-Farisi went to meet him and his story came to a full circle at that point what he had been looking for for so many years to find the true religion it finally became successful his journey finally found an end when he met rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam during those first few days that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam arrived in al madina the beautiful thing about the story of salman al farisi is that he narrates this story himself this is amazing he told this story himself and there is a detailed hadith there is a detailed narration in the musnad of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah, where Salman al-Farisi is telling Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma his story, his whole life story. So what better way to hear the story of Salman al-Farisi radiallahu an than hearing it in his own words. So inshallah we'll go over this hadith, we'll go over this narration, Salman al-Farisi telling his story. So Salman radiallahu an he says, I was a Persian man, one of the people of Asbahan. And this is a city in what is modern day Iran. From a village thereof called Jay. He was from the village of Jay. My father was the chief of the village. So you see Salman, he is the son of the chief. So he lives a very luxurious, affluent, comfortable life. Salman continues to say, and I was the dearest of Allah's creation to my father. So Salman's father, he loved him very much and he took care of him. He loved me so much that he kept me in his house near the fire as girls are kept in. So he loved his son so much that he always kept him inside the house. He didn't even like his son to go outside because he wanted to always keep him with him so that he would always be in front of his eyes. That's how much love Salman's father had for Salman. Salman continues to say, I strove hard in the religion of the Majus. So this was the religion of Salman and his father. They were Majus. Majus was a religion of people who worshipped a fire. So Salman's responsibility was to take care of that fire, to make sure that that fire doesn't go out. So he had a very, very important role in their rel religious services that he would keep that fire alight and make sure that it doesn't go out. So Salman, he became the keeper of that fire. And he says, I took care of that fire and I did not let it go out for a moment. So he was always constantly keeping an eye on this fire that the people used to worship to make sure that it never gets extinguished. He continues to say, my father had a huge garden 
and he was busy one day with some construction work. So he said, oh son, I am too busy with this building today, so go and check my garden. So Salman's father, he's a busy man, an affluent man, a powerful man, so he has a lot of different type of business that he needs to take care of. So one day he got busy with this construction. So he actually told Salman to go out. He said, Salman, I need you to take care of the garden today. So can you get out of the home and go to the garden and take care of it today? So Salman, he leaves his home. So when Salman went out on the way to his father's garden, he passed by a Christian church. So he says, I passed by one of the Christian churches where I could hear their voices as they were praying. So he could hear the Christians in the church praying. I did not know anything about the people because my father had kept me in his house. Salman, up to this point in his life, he was about a teenager at this point, maybe about 16, 17 years old. And he had never heard of any other religion except his religion, his fire-worshipping religion because he was always at home. So he didn't have this exposure to the environment. So now that he went out and he heard the Christians praying in the church, he got curious, he got interested. What is this? This is something that is different. So it aroused his curiosity. He said, I did not know anything about these people because my father had kept me in the house. When I passed by and heard their voices, I entered upon them to see what they were doing. So he heard the people praying in the church from the outside. He got curious. He went inside the church to see what this was all about. When I saw them, I was impressed with their prayer and I was attracted to their way. And I said, Wallahi, this is better than the religion that we follow. So he heard what they were saying. He listened to their prayers and he came to a realization that this religion seems more sensible and more logical to me than worshipping the fire. He says, Wallahi, I did not leave them until the sun set. So his father sent him out in the day to take care of the garden. And instead of going to the garden and taking care of his father's work, he hung out in the church until sunset. So he was there for hours. And I forgot about my father's garden and I did not go there. I asked the people of the church, where did this religion originate? They said in Sham, in the greater Syrian area. Then I went back to my father. So after spending basically the whole day with these Christians in the church, then finally in the evening after sunset, he goes home. Now his father was expecting him home a long time ago. It was just a little work he had to do in the garden and come back. So his father has been searching for him all over for hours at this point. Then I went back to my father who had sent people out to look for me. And I had distracted him from all of his work. So he was so worried, he was so stressed out. Where is Salman? Where is Salman? When I came to him, he said, Oh my son, where were you? Did I not ask you to do what I had asked you to do? Salman replied to his father, Oh my father, I passed by some people who were praying in a church of theirs. And I was impressed with what I saw of their religion. So Salman, he doesn't try to hide anything. He tells his father straight out, I went to the church, I heard their prayers, and I was really impressed with their religion. And he goes on to tell his father, Wallahi, I stayed with them until the sun set. And I was impressed with their religion. So his father now is worried. So he says to his son, Oh my son, there is nothing good in that religion. Your religion and the religion of your fathers is better than their religion. And Salman, he replied to his father very clearly. He said, No, by Allah, their religion is better than our religion. So he didn't try to hide anything from his father. He told them what he was, he told his father what was really on his mind. He said, No, their religion is better than our religion. That religion makes more sense than worshipping this fire. So now his father is very worried. Imagine his father is the chief of the village. Imagine if the chief of the village, his son, leaves the religion. So he was very worried about his reputation. He was very worried about what his son would do. So what did he do? He was so afraid for his son and perhaps that he would be more influenced by these Christians. So he took his son back into the house and he chained him up. 
So Salman's father chained him so that he could not go out of the house and he could not meet with those Christians or go to the church again. So once he was chained up, Salman's father kept him in the house, but Salman was able to smuggle a secret message to those Christians. And in the message, he said to these Christians, if any Christian merchants come to you from Syria, because the business people were always coming from Syria and going back. There were always these caravans going back and forth from Persia to Syria. So he was able to get this message out to those Christians. If any caravan comes from Syria, some caravan of Christians comes from Syria, then let me know about it. Let me know. So some Christian merchants eventually, they did come from Syria. And the Christians who were there in Persia, they were able to get a message to Salman that yes, there is a Christian delegation, there is a Christian caravan that has come from Syria and they're here. They're going to be here for a few days and then they're going to go back to Syria again. So Salman replied to these people, he said, okay, when they're ready to go back, when they finish with their business and they're ready to go back, then let me know. And tell them that I want to go back with them to Syria. So when they finished their business, Salman was able to escape from the shackles. He managed to escape from the chains of his father. And he went to that caravan and he joined them and they took him back to Syria. So when he reached Syria and he was told that this area, this is where Christianity had originated from. So now he was very excited. He wanted to learn more about the religion from the place where it had originated. So he asked the people, who is the best person in this religion? Who is the most knowledgeable person in Christianity? I want to go to him and I want to learn directly from him. So the people of Syria, they said, the bishop in the church, the main church of Syria, it had a bishop and they told Salman, this is the most knowledgeable man of Christianity. And if you have any questions and if you want to learn the religion from its source, you go and you learn from him. So Salman, he went to this bishop and he said, I like this religion and I would like to stay with you and serve you in your church and I would like to learn from you and I would like to pray with you. So this bishop, he said, come in. So I went with him and started to serve him. So Salman, he stayed with that man and he started to serve him and he started to learn the religion from him. But he noticed that this man turned out to be a munafiq. He turned out to be an evil man. And he would command the people to give sadaqah. He would go out and he would give speeches and tell the people, give in the way of Allah, give sadaqah, spend in the way of Allah. Spend so that the poor people amongst you can have some provisions. So he would collect sadaqah from the people but he would then keep it for himself and he would not distribute it to the poor and the needy. And Salman, he saw all of this. He was actually with him all the time, serving him. So he would see exactly what happened behind the scenes, that this man would collect sadaqah from these people under the pretense that he's going to distribute it to the poor and the needy. And then instead of doing that, he would just keep it for himself. So Salman was noticing all of this. So eventually, over time, this man, this bishop, he amassed seven chests, seven big chests full of gold and silver. Imagine how much, how much wealth that is. Eventually, what happened is that after some time, he died. This man, he died. And the people, they were very sad. They didn't know the reality of this man. They thought he was really a pious, good man. And when he died and the people were ready to bury him, Salman told them, he said, you know this guy of yours? He really was a very evil man. They were surprised. What are you talking about? He said, you know, he used to tell you to give in the way of Allah. He used to collect sadaqah from you. He used to collect charity from you. But instead of distributing it then to the poor people, he would just keep it all for himself. So they were shocked. How could this be? You know, this is our leader. So they said to Salman, if you're really telling us the truth, then show us where did he keep all of that charity? Where did he keep it? So Salman said, okay, I'll show you. I know exactly where he kept it. And he took them to the place where this man had kept all of this treasure. So they went there and they saw seven chests 
full of gold and silver. And when they saw that, they were so shocked and they were so angry that they said, Wallahi, we will never bury this man. He doesn't even deserve a proper burial. He doesn't even deserve for us to put him back in the earth. Instead, we will crucify him. We will put him on a cross and then we will stone his dead body. So that's what they did. They took his body, they put it on a cross and then they pelted him with stones. Then his position was replaced with another man. Now that their leader was gone, he was replaced with another man and Salman stayed with this man as well. And this man was actually a very, very good man. He was a very pious man. The man who took the place of the first bishop, he was actually nothing like the first bishop as, as, at all. He was actually a very sincere man, a very devoted man, and a person who feared Allah. Salman an says that I have never seen a man who does not offer the five daily prayers who was better than that man. Meaning, he has never seen someone who is not a Muslim who was better than that man. Meaning he was a very pious man, he was a very good man, and he was a very sincere man. Salman goes on to describe this man. He said he shunned this world and he sought the hereafter and no one strove harder than him day and night. I loved him as I had never loved anyone before and I stayed with him for a while. So Salman became very attached to this good man. Then when he was about to die, I went up to him and I said so and so, I was with you and I loved you as I had never loved anyone before. And now the decree of Allah has come to you as you see, you are about to die. So to whom do you advise me to go? What do you command me to do? After you die, what am I going to do? Who am I going to be with? Who is going to teach me? Who is going to help me to continue upon my journey to find the truth? So the man, he said, Oh my son, Wallahi, I do not know of anyone today who follows what I follow. The people are doomed. They have changed and abandoned most of what they used to follow. Except there is one man that I know. There is a man in Mosul, which is in modern day Iraq. He, there is a man in Mosul and this man, his name is so and so, and he follows what I am following. So go to him and join him. So eventually when this good man, when he died, he was buried and Salman, he continued his journey. He went to Mosul. So now look at his journey so far. He started from Iran. Then he went to Syria. Now he's going to Iraq, all in the search of the truth. So when he arrived in Mosul and he met this man, he said to him, oh, so-and-so, so-and-so advised me when he died to come to you. And he told me that you follow the same as he followed. So this man, he said to me, stay with me. So I stayed with him and I found him to be a good man who followed the same as his companion had followed. So he found this man in Mosul. He was also a very good man. But soon the time for his death came as well. When he was dying, I said to him, oh, so-and-so. So-and-so advised me to come to you. And he told me to join you. But now there has come to you from Allah what you see. The time of your death has come. So to whom do you advise me to go? What do you command me to do? Where do I go now after you pass away? So this man, he said, Oh my son, by Allah, I don't know of anyone who follows what we used to follow, except I know one man. There is a man in Nisibin. Nisibin is on the border of modern day Turkey and Syria. So he said, I know a man in Nisibin and he is the only man that I know who is upon what we were upon. His name is so-and-so, go to him. So when this man from Mosul died and he was buried, Salman, he continued his journey and he went to Nisibin. When he met the man there, he came to him and he told him his story. And then the man from Nisibin, he said to Salman, okay, stay with me. So I stayed with him and I found him to be a good man, a follower of the same way as his two companions. But soon death came to him as well. And when he was dying, I said to him, oh, so-and-so, so-and-so advised me to go to so-and-so. Then so-and-so advised me to come to you. 
to whom do you advise me to go and what do you command me to do and this man from Nisibin he said oh my son wallahi we do not know of anyone left who follows our way and to whom I can tell you to go except a man in Ammuriyah and Ammuriyah is further west in modern day Turkey he follows something like what we follow if you wish go to him for he follows our way so when he died and he was buried I went to the man in Ammuriyah and told him my story and he said stay with me so I stayed with a man who was following the same way as his companions look at this journey to find the truth from Iran to Syria to Iraq to the border of Syria and Turkey farther west in Turkey he's ready to do anything in his search for the haq in his search for the truth at the same time while he was with the man in Ammuriya learning from him he also worked as well Salman started to earn his living so he was able to earn some wealth of cows and sheep and then the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came to this man as well and the time of death came for this man as well so when he was dying Salman said to him oh so and so I was with so and so and so and so told me to go to so and so then so and so told me to go to so and so and then so and so told me to come to you to whom do you advise me to go and what do you command me to do after you he said oh my son wallahi I do not know of anyone who follows our way to whom I can advise you to go but there has come the time of a prophet there has come the time of a prophet who will be sent with the religion of Ibrahim he will appear in the land of the Arabs and he will migrate to a land between the two Harras meaning he will be in a land between two black fields of land between which there are palm trees he will migrate to a land which is in between two black fields and there will be palm trees in that land he will have characteristics this prophet he will have characteristics that will not be hidden and then he gave him three signs look for these three signs to know that this is the prophet he will eat of what is given as a gift if you give him something as a gift he will eat it but if you give him charity he will not eat it so those are two signs he will accept a gift and he will eat from a gift but he will not eat from charity and the third sign is that on his back between his two shoulder blades is the seal of prophethood the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he had a mark on his back between his shoulders and that was the seal of prophethood and it has been mentioned in the books of previous nations so this man he told salman that he will there will be a prophet that will appear in this land the land of palm trees this prophet he will accept food given to him as a gift and he will eat that food but he will not eat food from charity and he will have the seal of prophethood the mark on his back between his two shoulders if you can go to that land then do so then he died this man died and he was buried and Salman says I stayed in Ammuriyah as long as Allah willed I should stay then some merchants of Kalb some merchants of the tribe of Kalb they came and these were an Arab tribe and Salman saw this as an opportunity these people they're going to be going to the land of the Arabs that's where I need to go so perhaps I can go with them so he asked these people will you take me to the land of the Arabs and I will give you these cows and sheep of mine what he had been working and what he had earned in terms of his wealth these cows and these sheep that he had earned from his work he said I'll give it all to you I don't need it just take me to the land of the Arabs so they said yes sure so I gave them the cows and the sheep and they took me there they took me to the land of the Arabs but when they brought me to Wadi Al Qura they wronged me and they sold me to a Jewish man subhanallah look at what these guys did they took him he was a free man but they took him and they sold him into slavery when I was with him the Jewish man that he was sold to Salman says when I was with him I saw the palm trees the land of Arabs it is full of palm trees right 
I saw the palm trees and I hoped that this was the land that my companion had described to me, but I was not sure. See, he has been sold into slavery, but still the only thing that's occupying his, man, his mind is yes, I see the palm trees, maybe this is the land. You know, he's not concerned about himself. He's just concerned about finding the truth. While I was with him, while he was with the master, a cousin of his from Bani Qurayza came to him from Al Madina. So a cousin of Salman's owner from Medina, he came to visit his cousin. And the owner of Salman, the master of Salman, sold Salman to his cousin. And his cousin took him back to his home in Al Madina. While I was with him, a cousin of his from Bani Qurayza came to him from Al Madina and he sold me to him and he took me to Medina. So now he has reached Medina. By Allah, as soon as I saw, saw it, I recognized it from the description given to me by my companion. So as soon as he was in Medina, then he realized, yes, this is the place. This is where I have been trying to go. I am here now. So Alhamdulillah, he knew that he had reached his place. But he was a slave. And while he was there in Medina serving his master, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was in Mecca, the da'wah had started, and Salman is in Medina, and he doesn't hear anything about this. He knows nothing about it. So one day, Salman, he was doing some work for his master. He was on top of a tree doing some work for his master. And a man came with some big news and he said to Salman's owner, he said, the person that Aus and Khazraj, the person that they have been waiting for, he has come to Quba. He's there in Quba and they are saying that he is a prophet. They are saying that he is a prophet. So Salman is on top of the tree and he hears this conversation taking place between his master and this other Jewish man. And he realizes that this is it. This must be the prophet that I'm looking for. So he said when he heard that, he started to shiver that he was almost going to fall down from the tree. So he came down quickly from the tree and he asked his master, what did he tell you about? What is he talking about? And the master got very upset. He said, what is this slave? He's, what is this his business? I'm having a private conversation with someone and my slave comes and he's asking me about it. So he hit Salman. He said, this is none of your business. Don't talk to me about this. But Salman was very excited now. He was very excited. All of these years of searching and he was so close to finding what he was looking for. So he finished his work that day and then he asked his master for permission in the evening to go and take care of some of his personal work. So his master gave him permission. He said, okay, you can go. So Salman gathered some food that he had and he went there to Quba and he met Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But before he would take the shahada, he wanted to make sure that he fulfills the three conditions that was mentioned to him by his previous teacher in Ammuriyah. And remember the three signs that he will accept food that is a gift he will not accept food that is charity and he has the seal of prophethood, the mark on his back between his shoulders. So he came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, I heard that you came from out of town and I heard that you and your companions, you are good people. So I have some charity for you. Please accept it. So the Prophet ﷺ, he thanks Salman and he distributes that food to his companions and he doesn't eat any of it himself. So Salman thinks to himself, okay, this is number one. He didn't eat any of the charity himself. That was test number one. The next day, Salman comes back again and he says, I noticed that you don't eat from the charity, but today I got you a gift. So please have this food. So from that food, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he ate. So Salman thinks to himself, that's two. Two of the signs are fulfilled. Now the third sign is remaining. The seal of prophethood, the mark on the back of the Prophet ﷺ between his shoulder blades. But Salman is thinking, how am I going to get a chance to see this? The Prophet ﷺ is always wearing his rida, right? 
How am I going to see his back? I can't just go up to him and ask him, can I see your back? No, I can't do that. So he looked for an opportunity. When can I do this? So one day there was a janazah. One of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ had passed away. And the Prophet ﷺ was there to lead his janazah. So Salman thought this is an opportunity. It's a janazah, there will be so many people all around. There's a lot of crowd, a lot of pushing and stuff like that. I will be able to probably maybe pull down his, his upper garment a little bit and get a glance at his back between his shoulders to see if he has that seal of Prophet. So Salman, he's right behind the Prophet wasallam at this janazah, trailing him very closely by. And the Prophet wasallam he, he realizes something is going on here. He knows that this man is behind him and he's looking for something. He wants to see something. So the Prophet wasallam, instead of what a lot of people would do, hey, what are you doing? Why are you following so close behind me? Why are you tailgating me? What do you want? He didn't do that. The Prophet wasallam realized that this man was looking for something. So he actually shrugged his rida off his shoulder himself so that Salman could see what he was looking for. So once the Prophet wasallam removed that rida, Salman he saw the seal of prophethood and all of the three signs were now complete. So Salman, he couldn't hold himself anymore. He started to cry and he hugged the Prophet ﷺ from behind and he kissed that seal of prophethood. And the Prophet ﷺ told him, turn around, face me. So Salman, he turns around and he faces the Prophet ﷺ and he tells him the whole story. He tells Rasulullah ﷺ his whole story from his childhood in Asfahan in Iran and how he went to Syria and then how he went to Mosul in Iraq and then how he went to the Syrian Turkish border and then how he went to Ammuriya and then how he became a slave and then how he went to Wadi Al Qura and then how he ended up in Al Madina. And this journey, this whole thing happened over a period of more than 30 years since he left his home this place to that place to that place to that place this whole saga took place over a period of more than 30 years Salman radiallahu an he was around the same age as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam they were about the same age and he left his home he left his family when he was still a teenager and he finally meets the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes to Medina how old was the Prophet ﷺ in Medina? He was 53 years old. So more than 30 years of searching and Salman finally finds the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. So how can you blame him for not being able to control his emotions when he figured out finally that this is the Messenger of Allah. This is the man that I have been looking for. This is the man that I have been searching for. So he hugged him and he kissed his back. And the Prophet ﷺ listened to his story, the whole story. And Salman narrated the story in great detail. And then the Prophet ﷺ, after hearing this story, he gathered his companions and he told Salman, tell them your story, tell them your story. So he repeats the story again and tells the companions this amazing, amazing journey that he took. So this is how Salman became a Muslim. And this happened in the early days after the Prophet ﷺ entered al Madina. But remember, Salman, he's still a slave. He's still a slave. So because he was a slave, he was not able to witness the battle of Badr with the Prophet ﷺ. And he was not able to witness the battle of Uhud with the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ, he loved Salman. And he said to Salman, Ya Salman, go to your owner, go to your master and make a contract with him so that you can buy yourself out. You know, we'll help you. Just make a contract with your owner. How much does he want for you? And we will help you. You can buy yourself out of slavery. So Salman, he goes to his owner and he asks him, how much, how much payment do you want for my freedom? And the owner says, I will not free you except for 300 palm trees. 300 palm trees. 
and 40 measures of gold. And it was a certain measure of gold called the uqiyya. And that is equivalent to about 30 grams of gold. So he wanted 40 of this measurement of gold, which is about one measurement of that gold is about 30 grams. So he wanted 40 of those. So it's about 1,200 grams of gold. 1,200 grams of gold. You know how much that is worth even today? It's more than $50,000. So imagine how much it was worth in that day. So he said 300 palm trees and the 1,200 grams of gold. So this is a lot. So when Salman went back to the Prophet ﷺ and he told him, Ya Rasulullah, I spoke to my master and this is what he wants. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says to his Sahaba, he says to the companions, A'inu akhakum, help your brother. So everyone came to help Salman. Some of them gave him 10 palm trees. Some of them gave him 15. Some of them gave him five. Whatever they were able to give him from the palm trees that he needed, they gave him according to their ability until he was able to gather all 300 palm trees, these small palm trees to plant in the ground. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told Salman, Salman, dig the holes for these 300 palm trees. You dig the holes. And when you're finished digging, tell me, I will put the palm trees in the ground myself. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is willing to do this for Salman al-Farisi. I will put each one of them in the ground myself with my own hands. Subhanallah. So when Salman had dug the holes, he informed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with his blessed hands, he put each one of those palm trees into the ground. And Salman says, Wallahi, not a single one of them died. Every single one of them grew. And how could they not grew, grow if they were put in the ground by the blessed hands of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So all of those palm trees grew. So now they took care of that part, the 300 palm trees. But what was still remaining was the 1,200 grams of gold. So one day from one of the campaigns of the Prophet Sallallahu he was presented with some of the spoils of the war and amongst that was a piece of gold and it was, it was shaped like an egg. It was shaped like an egg. So Rasulullah Sallallahu calls for Salman. He thinks of Salman. Salman, he needs this gold. He needs it to buy himself out of his slavery. So he says, where is Salman? Call Salman. So the Sahaba, they bring Salman to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gives him this piece of gold. And he tells him, go to your owner and give it to him. And then Salman says, but how is this going to fulfill the requirement? He didn't think that it was big enough to be 1,200 grams of gold. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, just go ahead and do it. So he went and he measured it and it was exactly the right weight. It was the perfect amount. And he presented that to his owner and now Salman al-Farisi radiallahu an, he was a free man. So once he was a free man, he was able to accompany the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam on all of the expeditions after that. So this is the amazing story of this great companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Salman al-Farisi radiallahu an. Look at the journey of this man. Look at the search of this man for the truth. Going from Iran to Syria to Iraq to the Turkish-Syrian border, further west into Turkey, then into the Arabian Peninsula, then into Medina, just to find the truth, just to accompany the righteous and finally his journey led him to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Look at Salman, look what we can learn from him. He left a life of comfort and affluence in order to find the truth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him and he allowed him to find that truth. So this is the story of Salman al-Farisi. Like I said to me, this is the most amazing story of any companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam that you will ever hear. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Salman and the other companions in Jannah. Ameen. Inshallah next week we will continue with the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wallahu alam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.